Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the US University Athletic Recruitment Webinar. Um, my name is Basha. I'm one of the Education USA advisors here at Fulbright Commission. Um, just so you're aware, this webinar will be recorded and uh, we'll share the recording with you later this week. Um, we're joined today by Dr. Colin Barnes. Um, Colin, thank you for joining us. Um, can you introduce yourself to everyone? Mm, thank you, Vasha. Um, yes, my name is uh, Dr. Colin Barnes. I am over here in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm a university coach. Uh, currently, I've uh, worked within uh, football uh, for the past 20 years, but uh, my doctorate and uh, research is around coach learning. So I work with U.S. soccer and uh, it took me over to the U.K. and I taught at uh, a university in Southampton uh, within a football study. So I've kind of been able to experience both the coaching and the university settings in, um, in, in multiple places, so obviously in Europe and then in, in the U.S. Well, thank you, Colin. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, just so you're aware, aware if you have any uh, questions that you'd like to ask during this webinar, just pop them in the Q&A uh, part and we'll answer those at the end. All right. Um, so welcome, everybody. This is going to be hopefully uh, an informative and uh, an opportunity for you to be able to ask questions that uh, that you're interested in. So uh, the basic premise is we are trying to provide the uh, kind of the framework and the pathway for students uh, from outside the U.S. to be able to come to university using um, athletics or sports. Uh, to be able to help, uh, you know, get you across. So um, before we start, go ahead, uh, Basha, and we'll kind of set down some, some of the objectives for today. So first off, as you know, there's a, the, the country is a, a pretty big one. There are many, many universities uh, across uh, the uh, basically our continent. Um, but for today, we're going to try and address um, all of the different collegiate organizations. So for many of you, uh, we use the term universities in the U.S. You're also going to hear the term colleges. And when we say collegiate organizations, we're talking about um, kind of like the national governing bodies or different leagues uh, if you're uh, within football or, or other sports. And there's actually a few that, uh, that kind of go unnoticed that we need to make sure that uh, everyone's aware of. Um, then we're going to address uh, scholarships and aid, so ways that you can get um, money taken off of it. Uh, unfortunately, because there's a lot of opportunity in America, universities are actually very costly. So um, they're they're pretty expensive with some reaching up into the $80,000 a year, not for the four years, but for uh, just for one year. And so uh, being able to get scholarships and aids is really important. So we're gonna go through the, the different kinds. Um, then we'll address uh, admissions for international students, all the things that you're, you're gonna need. Um, some of the basic rules, and then finally, um, we'll get into the recruiting process, how you as, a, as an athlete can be uh, recruited and uh, or be observed or seen by college coaches. So uh, to make sure that we have kind of the, uh, the rules set place, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that uh, be patient with us. There might be a couple of mistakes uh, as we go through this webinar. So um, if there's any snafus, uh, ho hopefully we'll try and remedy them quickly. Um, if you are having any technical issues, our producer, uh, as you know, is Basha. Just go ahead and uh, pop a, a chat message to her directly. Um, we'll be using that chat function uh, throughout this webinar. You can use it. So if any question comes uh, up during, uh, during any one of the sections, you don't need to wait until the end uh, to the actual Q&A. You can just pop it into the Q&A chat uh, immediately. Uh, at the end, if you have a question, we'd love to be able to answer it. And if you want to um, unmute yourself to be able to do that, that's great. Otherwise, let's keep yourself muted to begin with. Um, we might 
ask questions if if something happens and but you're always have the ability to say no and uh, we welcome uh, for you guys to use your uh, webcam at any point um, the main rule which will be the next slide basha is we're going to be talking in the general so the one law that is going to surround this entire talk is that each organization is different each division within that organization is different every sport might have a little different uh, rules and then each and every uh, university is going to have maybe some slightly different uh, context so every the we're going to try and dance around and give give you as much information that's in the general and hopefully we can try and be able to answer questions that are a little bit more specific um, as we go so um we're trying to give you the broadest landscape and then hopefully be able to answer any specific questions as we go so to start off with there are three main uh, collegiate organizations for athletics um, there are thousands of universities within uh, the u.s systems um, but the three that uh, provide sporting avenues in what we call championships are these three. And the biggest is going to be the NCAA, which many of you um, have probably heard of, or at some point, many of the big universities out there probably fall within the NCAA. But there's also a couple of other ways. And we have the NAIA and then also the NJCAA. And we're going to go into detail for each of the three. Starting with the National Junior College Athletic Association. So the term junior college and community college become one. So they're, they're talking about the same uh, type of uh, university. These are two-year degrees, meaning when you go there, you'll um, you'll actually get a degree um, but you're only allowed to participate for two years many many players or uh, student athletes um, use this uh, because it is a uh, far less expensive um, place to go they might use it to make sure that if their academics aren't um, at the level of a four-year institution um, that they may go there to get those grades back up uh, or, um, you know, accomplish a foreign language or whatever it might be. Um, I've And in the past, there was a Spanish player that uh, was a youth international. She did not get into a four-year program in the NCAA. She went to a community college and um, then went to a uh, four-year program after that and was able to do really well. She now plays uh, professionally in America. So th this is a very good tool uh, for many people. There are 525 schools around the country um, that offers 16 sports. So I don't, uh, obviously I have a background within um, proper football, um, but there are many others and um we tend to look at it from a men's and a women's side so um all most of these uh sports um have a men and a women's component softball and baseball um are uh similar to each other so kind of like rounders and crickets uh in the uk or elsewhere the next organization is called the NAIA, um, and it has 252 universities with over 20 conferences. It has uh, a roughly the same amount of sports. I think uh, the um, the junior college had, uh, I think, a mar half marathon uh, as a uh, considered a sport. But the difference between uh, this organization and the junior college route um, is it has four-year degrees. And the rules that are um, governed by the coaches for recruitment are far less, um, you know, hindering. Meaning, uh, for for me as an NCAA coach, 
I'm not allowed to speak to certain um, aged uh, student athletes, meaning if they are too young, we're not allowed to speak to them about recruiting yet. Um, while for NAIA, um, you can contact people um, freely throughout uh, their recruitment time. Um, so this is another good way to be able to come across um, and be able to play uh, a wide variety of sports uh, for you. The final one is the NCAA. And this is the one where you probably see the most notoriety in terms of, um, you know, uh, being on, on the telly, being uh, seen and observed uh, for all the different sports. So there's roughly over 100 or uh, 1,100 uh, schools in as many as three divisions. So we have three divisions within the NCAA. In Division One and Two, they offer athletic scholarships. And we're going to get to those uh, scholarships in uh, in just a minute. Division three does not. So they only allow uh, academic scholarship and aid. So um, there is a difference right there within the NCAA. Um, even though it is uh, does not allow for athletic scholarship, these tend to be your more academic schools. So some of the most prestigious schools in the country, uh, University of Chicago, uh, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh, are wonderful universities. They offer great athletics, but they do not offer scholarships. So that may be a place where you may want to go for your specialized uh, field, but um, you wouldn't be able to get aid or scholarship through your athletic uh, prowess. You would then get it through your academics or um, possible grants uh, from other places. In 1972, we had what was called Title IX that came into place, and this kind of changed the landscape of uh, athletics. Before, it was very male-dominated, and uh, the women, there weren't many uh, opportunities allowed for women, and the money that was uh, attached to it was very little. But because of that, that has changed. Title IX now um, guarantees the equity for both men and women. So in order to be a Division I uh, university, you have to offer at least 12 sports, and they have to have at least six uh, female um, sports within those 12. And so there needs to be that equality, which is also with scholarships. So the amount of scholarships offered for both men and women, and then the resources and facilities that are used. Um, Eligibility-wise, if you have uh, played professionally and, and earned money for your, uh, for your sport, um, the NCAA has an amateurism, so there's a little bit of rules. There are some sports that uh, maybe golf and a little bit of tennis that you can get around it. Um, but for the most part, the NCAA um, uh, ensures that amateurism uh, starts. So uh, while you're in there, you're not going to be able to uh, be able to make money um, uh, through your sport until we came into our, a new thing that just popped up called name, image, and likeness. So this is where um, now there's a little bit more um, uh, funds that are coming out. And it's a, a very hot topic um, based off of a, a recent um, uh, a court decision. Um, there's also now a transfer portal. Previously, when you were at a university, you would have to sit out a year if you wanted to change a university and go to a different one. Uh, now there's basically uh, freedom for uh, student athletes to be able to move from one university to another without uh, penalty. You just need to be able to find the university that uh, that you're going to. So we can discuss that uh, in detail if, if, if that's something of, of interest. Um, but now the landscape, most of us, if you go to the next one, Basha, we tend to think division one, two, and three um, in this pyramid model, which we see this uh, at, uh, at the football level. You have different leagues, you get promotion, you get to move up into the next one, or if you had a bad year, you get relegated. 
and you go down. This, by, by looking at this, we tend to assume that the division three is less than division two, which is less than division one. And that's not always the case. Um, if, if you know anything about the American uh, sports system, whether it's the draft in the NBA, Major League, uh, NHL, or NFL, um, we don't have that ability to get promoted or relegated. Even within the MLS, they've kept the American model. So universities tend to stay at the same level uh, regardless. So division one is that thought of as the highest. And the assumption that it has the most money and it has the most resources is probably true. But that doesn't mean that all division one schools out of the um, 340 schools that are out there in division one, at least for women's soccer, that doesn't mean that number 342 is inherently better than uh, the division two schools. I've worked at a division two school and we were a top 25 within our sport and we regularly beat uh, division one schools in the, in the uh, non-competitive seasons uh, when we were able to compete against them. And so there's some overlap between division two into division one as well as division three. So um, just because a program says that they're division one doesn't necessarily mean that um, they have better facilities, better competition, better coaching, um, and things like that compared to um, the quote-unquote lower divisions. So it really depends on um, the sports uh, and the kind of university that, uh, that you're looking at. So want to make sure that that is uh, quite, quite clear. So now we go into the types of scholarships. So there's three uh, ways, uh, general ways, that you can receive money um, to not have to pay the full 80000 or whatever the, um, whatever the amount. So within a university, you have tuition, which is all the academic uh, money to be able to go to the classes. You've, you, you typically are going to have fees for uh, housing. You're going to have fees for um, food. You're also going to have some other uh, fees that get attached uh, for use of um, technology, uh, use of the facilities for um, uh, recreational lifting and, and all the things that you would, you would do. But you can receive uh, money to not have to pay for some, of, uh, some or most of those things through these three ways. The first one is the academic scholarship and universities will provide um, money based off of your academic achievement. And that comes from um, what you've achieved previously. So whether it's your uh, GCE scores, whether it's um, you know, your, uh, your secondary school records, whatever it may be. Um, the second way is the athletic scholarship. And this is the one that, uh, that you are probably interested in the most. So uh, each institution has a certain amount of money that they can uh, use. So for, for uh, women's soccer or women's football uh, at the division one level, we are allowed 14 full or equivalent scholarships each year that we can use. We can break that up into half scholarships. We can break that up into full and, and, and that's all. Um, it's up to the, to the coaches to do that. Um, people tend to break it down depending on the value of, of the student athlete. Um, but that allows us to be able to um, give some money uh, back to the student athlete. The third way is grants, aids, or, and, or possibly even your own government that you're coming from. Um, in previous years, I've seen uh, governments from certain uh, countries that will actually help pay uh, for whatever the, the schooling is and whatever the percentage amount. Um, we do that uh, in America for some uh, cost of living. Uh, they will, um, there's a couple of grants uh, as well in Florida and Georgia uh, called the Hope Scholarship. And I can't remember the one, I think it's the Star in, um, in Florida, 
where if you have really good grades in your secondary and you maintain those grades uh, at the university, they will take uh, tuition 50% off. And so um, every situation is different. There's also uh, aids from a financial standpoint. So if you, uh, in America, if you can uh, show your uh, taxes and show that you don't earn or your family doesn't earn that much money and um, in you, in order to go there, you would need help, they may be able to provide a based off of how much money that your family uh, earned. Um, obviously, if your family is really well off and and uh, can afford it, then you may not get any any of that kind of aid. So there's all sorts of different ways. Every university is going to have um, you know grant and aids that you can apply for. Um, so um, the situation is going to be different depending on one yours how much money your family makes, um, what country you're coming from, and what might be provided, plus the university that you're applying to. They may, they may have some other things. We call these three ways of, of paying for your uh, schooling stacking. So you can stack these different scholarships or grant aids together. So let's imagine um, you were able to earn 25% uh, from an academic scholarship. You were also able to, the university coach said that um, they would be willing to pay for 50% of your scholarship. You're already up to 75% of what the total bill is going to be. And maybe you're able, your government would be able to have 25% as well. You would have full scholarship uh, all, all taken care of. Uh, because of that. So um, this, this is that term stacking where you can stack these scholarships onto each other. Next, you're going to have to be able to get admitted uh, to the university. Now, every university, like we said, is going to have different requirements and they have been evolving since uh, COVID and the pandemic. So uh, undoubtedly, there's going to be some sort of a visa to come uh, into the country to be able to uh, to be educated. Um, this may come into the form of an F1, an H1B, an L2, or whatever. Your your situation is going to uh, to help you through that to find out which one uh, makes sense. You're going to have to show um, English proficiency. Uh, in the past, that's been the uh, TOEFL. Um, recently, uh, Duolingo is now um, an acceptable form of um, uh, showing that proficiency. At some universities, it may only be 100 or it might be up to 120. Again, every university is going to have different a different criteria that you need to check into. Um, you're going to have to provide secondary school records. You're also going to have to um, be able to get in and... Um, in order to be eligible um, to participate within the NCA, this is not the case for the other organizations, the NG, NJCAA or the NAIA, you'll have to get into the clearing house, which um, uh, shows that you are eligible to play, uh, meaning you've updated all of your transcripts uh, from secondary school, you've uh, shown your Duolingo score, um, you've signed the, um, you know, eligibility with uh, amateurism and all sorts of different little criterias. And um, the final way is uh, standardized tests. Now, this used to be uh, something that is going away. Um, it used to be something that people needed to take the SAT or ACT. And now, um, because of COVID and because of the pandemic, um, it is now an optional thing. So um, most, most universities are uh, starting to uh, slide away from that and only using uh, your secondary school records and transcripts plus the proficiency. Now, once you have that idea that uh, you've got all those things taken care of, now you want to be able to find the university that fits your athletic ability um, or a place that you want to be able to compete at, uh, at the university level. So um, it starts off with uh, your preparation. That means 
you figured out and written down um, and had discussions with family members and uh, probably coaches in and around uh, your little support network. So we tend to say that you need to be able to prioritize the most important things, and we break it down into four categories. Uh, the first one is going to be um, your uh, athletics. Uh, is athletics the most important thing? It could be financial. Um, it could be the academic piece. Or it could be where you want to live uh, or where you want to go and you go to university. Some people don't don't want to go to a big uh, city. So may, maybe um, NYU is right in the heart of New York City and, and you, you've been to London, you've been to Paris and those big cities aren't, aren't what you want. You want to go to uh, a place where you get to see trees or maybe even a warmer climate, go down to Florida for university. So out of those four uh, things, you need to kind of prioritize which is the most important. And, uh, you know, if it's an academic uh, field, something specific like coastal engineering, well, there's only a few universities um, that, uh, that you could go to. So maybe that's a little bit higher than your, your sport that you want to play. If it's the sports, uh, then you need to find out where you are going to be best fit uh, to be able to play, compete, and do very well. And that's where your support group uh, comes in. So hopefully your coaches or the people you work with that know your ability level uh, can be able to help out. So now that you have your priority list set, now you can kind of go into being recruited. Um, and the first thing is you need to be observed by the university coaches that you're, you're kind of interested in. Um, this is an, a really important piece. Um, and because you are, you are in a, a place far away from the actual universities, film becomes really important, meaning you're going to have to have, um, you know, film of you playing, uh, participating, or what it, whatever the context is for your sport, um, or, or your times, or whatever it might be, to be able to give to the coaches that you're interested in. The next step, once you send this out, is contact. Now, there's kind of two ways, there's two directions that this contact uh, comes in. First, you may be sending out all of your contact. Here's highlights of, of me playing. Here's full match uh, film. Um, here are the times in the 400 meter and the 400 meter relay uh, that you run, whatever the context that you have. You may be sending that out to all of those universities that you've identified that uh, or where you want to go, whether it's warm, the academic area, or um, you're just interested in playing. The second contact is actually the university coach contacting you, and they say, yep, we're really interested in you. We think you could you could help our program. You could help our team. We would be very uh, interested in bringing you uh, onto our team or bringing you to the university. In America, the next step would be being able to go on to a visit, um, you know, and, you know, we would, uh, as a coach, we would bring uh, the athlete, the student athlete, their family onto our campus, be able to show them uh, all the facilities, show them what the university is like, take them to our academic buildings, show them all, everything that they would need to know. For you, um, this may be a, a highly difficult thing, meaning it take it's going to take a lot of money to be able to fly over um, someone that they are interested in to be able to show them on campus. It is allowed, though. So, um, so during your, um, I guess we call it our senior year. So, whatever the uh, year right before uh, you're able to go to university. You're allowed for official visits, which the university can pay for uh, things that you, you do, meaning flying you over, paying for your accommodation, paying for your meals, and everything associated with that visit. 
it's highly unlikely that it it will happen regularly but for some of the very big universities at the uh, what we call the power five conferences that have lots of american football money they they may have those uh the ability to be able to uh have the funds to be able to do that but for the vast majority of universities uh in america that probably won't happen and what we do is we'll have Zoom calls to be able to show you things. And this is where we might be able to get to meet parents. Um, you would be able to get to ask questions and find out um, more about the program. And you being able to ask those questions is really important. So after you've done all that, the final decision uh, comes into play. And this is where you get to weigh your choices. And if we go all the way to the full circle, Basha, you can, we, we get full circle with the preparation. So remember that priority list at the beginning. In order to make your decision to, this, to the university that you love, you go back to the original priorities. So if, um, you know, being in the South, being in warm climate is really important, that may tell you that you probably don't need to go to NYU or the University of Wisconsin. Um, you may be looking and going, all right, that, that amount of, uh, th that scholarship down at the University of Florida sounds really good right now. That's where I need to go. So it all comes back down to your preferences. And this cycle in the recruiting process happens over and over again. It might happen a couple of times as you get closer to that decision and there aren't a lot of offers. Maybe there's only one or two and they don't quite feel like the right fit. You may have to go back and, uh, and, and start again. But that's this is going going to uh, hopefully set you uh, set you up to be able to know how to go through this process. Now, specifically, the hardest thing for for international uh, students to be able to know the landscape um, of American and university uh, sports is how you're going to get to be uh, seen by these uh, collegiate coaches, these sport coaches. So the first thing you need to consider is whether you have an, uh, you are in an individual sport or whether you're in a team sport. Being able to send video of you performing by yourself is a lot different than you performing on the football team. Um, you're going to need to have lots of video and already cut up highlights if you're in a team sport environment. Um, while if you're a golfer and, um, you know, you go to a known golf course and you shoot a 66, it's probably pretty good. And coaches in golf don't need to actually see uh, you perform. They just need to know what you're scoring, similar to uh, to other sports. Um, the other thing to consider would be how the U.S. participates uh, and how good they are uh, in that sport. So let's take baseball as an example. 20 years ago, most of the athletes that came uh, to play uh, baseball at university were probably American. Um, in the last 20 years, though, things have changed. Um, there's a lot of Caribbean countries that are becoming very good, and you can see it in the uh, in the Major League Baseball, that there's a lot of internationals coming in and playing and, um, you know, performing much better than the Americans. So there might be a difference in how you are perceived. I can go ahead and tell you if you're a, a Brazilian male and uh, you're interested in coming to the U.S., there are probably many uh, American universities uh, that are looking for a Brazilian footballer. Um, they will be, they, you are gonna be perceived as being very good uh, comparative uh, to the Americans. So it just depends on uh, the sport that you, you perform in. Um, only recently have I heard of um, what it would be, it would be Australian uh, Aussie rule kickers are now coming over to uh, American football to do punting or kicking. Um, I think I just heard of a, a, a Finnish boy that came over to Alabama to play American football, but he was, um, he is a, a lineman. So um, playing uh, a sport that basically only Americans play, you, you might not get a as warm of a welcome um, comparative to the other sport. The next thing is 
um, knowing if you're a time sport or if you're playing at an international level or knowing what the league uh, that you're playing in. So if you're uh, within athletics and uh, times don't lie, that's basically how um, all of the athletic uh, coaches are um, are recruiting. They want to know what times you have and when did you last do that versus if you play in a league um, that is unknown. So maybe it's uh, Slovenia's um, third division um, for football. It may it's kind of an unknown. The the quality of the games may not be very good, um, meaning you're winning eight nil in a game. It's really hard to identify. So those are really hard um, uh, to be able to uh, for us as as coaches to really be able to spot talent that way. And then lastly, how are you gonna be able to put together all this film? Because it takes uh, a little bit of time, not only to put a highlight film, but to actually um, collate all of the, the, the match film together. Uh, it, is, it is kind of a, um, uh, an unwritten rule that you should have a little bit of both. So don't just have some, some coaches may only like uh, to see highlights, while other coaches want to see the full match film. It is in your best interest to have both and to keep it as up to date as possible. So making sure that uh, every time you go and compete, that you keep keep track of who's going to be recording or how is this going to be um, recorded so we can be able to uh, share with others. Really important aspects. Um, now, the landscape of being um, uh, seen has changed uh, within the last 10 years. Um, what is known as agents or uh, handlers is becoming more prevalent. And so um, it, it, we have seen them uh, email as a, as a college coach. We get those emails frequently. Um, we don't know how to take those emails, they're all, sometimes they're a little sketchy. Um, you're probably um, going to be asked uh, by a company of some sort at, uh, whether you want to invest uh, in them to be able to do it. At the end of the day, it is you and you alone that uh, will uh, allow for scholarship or to be able to uh, be seen. Um, it is, it is not just on an agent. We as coaches trust our eyes and trust our uh, ability to, to, to spot talent. And um, so agents aren't necessary. Um, we do deal with them, um, but that doesn't mean they need to be there. And you have to outweigh the cost of, um, of paying for those services versus can you do these things on your own. The other aspect that's that started to pop up are showcases, at least within uh, women's and men's football. Um, so they may in London a few few months ago, there was a showcase. And so players from all around could go into one location, pay for uh, pay for the showcase to be able to play and perform. Um, the event was recorded and could be sent out. Um, all of your contact information was there. Some coaches go in and attend, meaning collegiate coaches from America would come over and attend, or um, those film and that re those recordings would be sent out to coaches. Um, we as coaches are a little bit skeptical um, of those showcases, not to say that it can't work, um, but it is an unknown um, level of play that worries us. So similar to the, you know, eight nil third division of a, of, of a smaller um, uh, country, it may not, uh, it may not be ha the best way for uh, colleges and coaches uh, to be able to evaluate. So um, again, you're going to have to outweigh your, if you don't have any film on you, and you can't get film, and this is a way for you to at least have some film, it might be worth it. Um, uh, if you need to become, you know, more familiar and, and feel less anxious playing in front of others, maybe that's a way to do it. So this is, this is up to everyone's situation, but um, they, are, they are not places that we uh, tend to recruit from uh, regularly. All right.
We're into the Q&A, Basha. Great. Thank you, Colin. That was great. Um, so we have a few questions. Um, can you just explain if you, I know you mentioned it a little bit, but someone asked if a sports scholarship will cover the whole cost of their studies. Uh, that's a great question. I would, my assumption is no, um, simply because, uh, you know, a, a British citizen that comes over to America then has to pay for taxes uh, while they're in America, same as other international students. Um, so there's one little caveat that uh, when we talk about, um, you know, expenses that a university cannot cover. Um, so if if we are charging you for those taxes, I usually government, U.S. government um, fees don't apply to non-citizens. Um, it's usually to, to the people that are um, paying regularly their taxes and are a part of that nation. Now, there might be, uh, which I, again, I don't know, there might be some uh, government aids or um, some, some type of funding from the British government to allow you to go over. I, I, I don't know. I know it happens in other uh, countries. Um, so I don't know if uh, the specifics on each individual one, but I, I'll check and try and report back if that's okay, Basha, on, on the question. My guess is probably no. Is that uh, Kumar? Yeah, yeah. And then um, another question. Actually, Kumar um, asked if there's any um, government funding. So in the UK, you can't take the, the UK funding to the US. Um, however, many US universities do offer financial aid and additional grants to UK students or international students on as a whole. Um, you just have to, when you apply to that university, you just need to check if that university provides any sort of either financial aid or like um, Colin mentioned, um, merit scholarships. So those are the academic scholarships um, if they are provided for uh, international students. And if they are, then you can apply for it. Um, Another question. Um, I actually have a question, Colin. Um, awesome. Are the sports scholarships guaranteed for all four years whilst you're uh, doing your undergraduate? Um, and that's a little bit in debate. Let me get you the simple answer is um, it should be, it, barring that there are no hiccups along the way. And those hiccups could be um, you fail out. So there's a couple requirements that you have to maintain. Um, you cannot lose your scholarship based off of your uh, athletic performance. You can lose it based off of um, your academics and uh, breaking team rules and, and those sort of things. So um, it is not based off of that. Perfect. And can you just explain, um, because it's a bit different here in the UK, um, it doesn't matter what grades you get, you can play sport at a U um, UK university. Um, can you just explain how it, it works in the US? Yeah, uh, that's a good point. We didn't go over that. In order to be a, uh, a college athlete, um, you need to maintain a... Um, I'll say it's a high GPA, but it uh, for some for for women's football we have very uh, you know academic prowess uh, students. So um, we use the four point system. Is that is that foreign, uh, Basha? Do we do we need oh, to explain four point It's um it's foreign. There's not really okay. a way to translate it into the UK okay. system. Um, I guess a four point yeah. would be the equivalent of getting um all A's on your A levels. Yeah. That's the closest yeah. as you I could explain it without going into more Yeah. Um so basically a 2.0 would be um getting uh C's and above. Um but the C the A B C D F markings don't aren't the same numbers. Uh so it is in order to maintain your eligibility you need to have, I think it's a 2.7 or higher uh, GPA. So there's a marking system and you need to do well. So basically um, C marks and above uh, for all of your, uh, for your classes. 
Um, you also have to pass a certain amount of, um, we call them credits or modules in the UK. Um, so uh, at, at Solent, we had three classes uh, per semester. In the US, the bare minimum is probably going to be around four. Um, and you need to uh, pass enough classes in each year and stay on track. Now, the good thing is, is that we have uh, support and academic advisors that are helping you. So you're not alone uh, doing this. You have um, academic support. You have uh, tutors if you need to. There's plenty of resources that allow you to make sure that you stay on track. Great. Thank you, Colin. Um, I had another question. Um, how long can you play a sport at a university in the U.S.? Um, here in the U.K., as long as you're a part-time or full-time student, um, yeah. you could play sport in the box league. Um, is that the same in the U.S.? Um, uh, to answer the question, yes and no. So there's three forms of what we would consider sports uh, at the university level. What we've been talking about is the first form, and that is the competitive. This is um, scholarship is, uh, athletic scholarship is attached to it. Um, you know, in here, you only get um, four years of eligibility that you need to finish um, within five years. And we say the clock starts in the first semester that you begin. So let's say that this is my uh, my first year. Uh, my clock would have started back in August of 2022, and I would have five years to complete four uh, seasons. Now, if I um, if I played in four seasons uh, or four years, I wouldn't get a fifth one uh, just because I finished on time, and uh, you only get four competitive seasons to play. Um, the second uh, way you can play sport at university is then what we call the club uh, team. So for some sports, you're going to have what they call a club team. This is probably more akin to or more uh, like what university sport is in the UK, where um, it's student driven. You're playing. You can play against other universities, but you tend to stay close to your area. Um, there's even national championships and things like that. So that's probably Bucks League is probably um, the same or similar to club. Then within the university and typically with those club teams, there's usually only one team. So you don't have, you know, three or four teams in many divisions. They keep it uh, fairly simple. Um, and the, the counteract uh, for American universities is then we have what we call intramurals which means it's all in-house uh, university-run uh, sport that is more fun than competitive. They, they'll have championships, and if you, if you win your, your sport, you get a T-shirt that says you're a champion, um, but it is not w the same as what we're talking about here. There's, um, it's all in-house-run stuff. Great. Um, we have a question from one of the mm -hmm. attendants. Um, does the trainer have to interview only with the potential student or are parents um, allowed to join the interview as well? Or even, even the coach that this, the athlete is uh, okay. part of the team? Does that make sense? Um, let, me, uh, let me see if I can uh, figure so, out. So the okay, trainer... So Correct. So it, let's just say I'm um, an athlete and I have an interview with you and uh -huh. my parents and my coach also joined the interview. Yeah, it's, it, it depends on um, it depends on the coach. More than likely, we would say yes. Get them on the Zoom call. Um, we would love most coaches would wouldn't say no. Nope, it can only be these people. Um, the more we get to know uh, the the support group around whoever, because we want we want to know who we're recruiting. Um, and I think I think if you look at it from a uh, from a you know world footballing um, perspective, I think we all can kind of relate to that. If we're about to purchase or buy or spend money, uh, major money on someone, we want to know who we're getting. And it's the people around you that is really important. So, um, so yeah, that, that, that can be a part of it. Yes. 
So it's it's um, more of a holistic approach as you are with the applications as well to U.S. universities. Now, applications uh, to sorry, universities. Sorry, as in, I mean, I mean, yeah. the your approach is holistic, similar yes. to the application process, where it's okay. not just yes. a, yeah. I get you. Yep. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Misa. Um, she'd like to know if there are any scholarships for athletes who don't participate in any competitions anymore because of health issues, but have certificates and degrees in gymnastics, for example. Hmm. Um, do, 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 do. There, now, if you are not going to be competing, but you maybe want to coach, or if you want to, if you have a degree in we call it athletic training. The equivalency would be physiotherapy. Um, there are other ways. So I got my uh, master's degree as a coach um, and I got it paid for. So we call those graduate assistants or graduate assistantships. So you can get uh, schooling paid for. I got, I even had housing and food and all of that taken, uh, given and, um, a stipend that's how I did my PhD as well is I was able to teach classes at the university so there are other ways to get your schooling paid for um, strictly speaking with the undergraduate there might be um, some assistantships on uh, on campus to be able to you know uh, help help with different uh, departments so yes great um, we have another question um, so for academic scholarships, um, do they give equal weight to qualifications or are some considered to give better opportunity to gaining scholarships? For example, A-levels, B-tech or IB, um, IB. I think this is um, a question more towards me. Um, yeah. From uh, my knowledge, uh, universities, um, a lot of four-year universities in the U.S. do not accept B-techs. However, the A-levels and the IB um, qualifications are seen as equivalent, um, especially as the IB is getting more popular nowadays. Um, Two-year colleges, so community colleges, will accept BTECs as well. Um, and also two-year colleges are a bit less rigorous in regards to your academic scholarships and the application processes are a bit less rigorous. I'm not sure if it's the same for um, if you um, need to be eligible to play sport, Colin. Maybe if you could um, add anything to that. Um, it we tend to think uh, or, or say that if we are interested, if the athlete, so the athletic department uh, and how the sports teams at a university, they operate as a kind of separate entity, even though they're within the university. So then we have the admissions department. Um, and if a student athlete that we recognize that we really want, um, that we think is good enough and we want them to come to our university, we will almost tag them to the admissions uh, department um, and let them know. Some universities do, some universities don't, but it, it kind of helps um, be able to, um, you know, maybe push along. Um, we do have uh, preferential treatment to uh, student athletes. Um, within registration. So because they, you know, we have uh, practices at certain times, they need to be able to take certain classes um, uh, at different parts of the day to avoid our practice times and training times. So, so there's a little bit of, um, you know, differences there. But other than that, uh, the, none that I'm aware of, Asha. Okay. Um, and I just have one more question for you. Um, is there a way for students to check if they would be eligible to play in um, NCAA or in the other leagues that you mentioned? Um, the clearinghouse would be uh, whether they, that would be the easiest one. Um, and I think it's uh, NCAA clearinghouse.com. Uh, that, that may or may not be right, but it's at least um, if you type that into Google, you should be able to get, uh, find out where that is. Um, now, whether you're capable of, uh, of playing, uh, your sport at a university, 
there are so many universities, I'm almost willing to say that there should be an opportunity uh, for everyone uh, to be able to gain. With all those organizations, um, there is plenty of opportunity. Uh, to give you an example, my uh, my brother, many uh, this is ten years ago, um, went. He's a referee for football. He went to a university match, and I think it was NAIA. Um, and the game started with only eight players on each team because they didn't have enough players, uh, student athletes, on their teams to start the game or to even be in the game. So that means that there's plenty of places that are looking for uh, student athletes. So it's it's now being able to figure out which university are you willing and wanting to go for. And that's where that uh, preparation comes from. It's doing your research, figuring out well, uh, what part of the country, you know, what level you you can uh, you can play at and then go from there. What can you afford and, and all of that? Okay, I think we have time. There's two more questions. Um, I think we okay. might have time for them. So the first one um, is, are all sports scholarships equally available in state colleges compared to private colleges in the U.S.? Mm. Oh, that's a good one in terms of, I, I don't think that we could get to the heart of the equally available. Um, it is uh, equally available in terms of, remember I said uh, for Division I, there are 14 scholarships. That is the most you can have. That doesn't mean that every school has 14 and how schools or teams or coaches use that money is up to them. Um, but there is a little bit of uh, equality um, and the NCA is known for making these kinds of rules. Um, there's a lot that we haven't got into. We've tried to uh, simplify this as much as we could. Um, so technically, yes. Now, um, private institutions, as you can imagine, are much more expensive than state schools. So for a university like ours, um, it's, I think the cost is 21000 a year versus uh, a private institution that's really good, like a uh, Duke University, which is closer to that 80000 So it might cost the same amount for all four years at our university compared to one year at a, at a big private school. Great. And um, just one more question uh, from Vanessa. Um, she says, uh, she's asking if volunteering qualifications, um, so for example, England athletic officiating roles, are these taken into account for application for sports scholarships? So can you just clarify about mm -hmm. the um, how yeah. to get a sp sports scholarship? Um, yeah. Is it something so, that you apply for or? Yeah, you, 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 for these scholarships, unlike the, the merit aid, or uh, the other grants and aids, sports scholarship, you get offered by the coach of that sport from that institution. It is like a tryout. You're either good enough and you're given a spot or you're good enough and here's how much money we think you're worth. Otherwise, you don't get offered uh, a role in there. You can still go to that university as a student, but you would not be able to participate with that team. So this is very much a um, uh, a try at, try out, and you're either good enough or you're not. All the other details, like other things you put on your app, uh, what you would consider your application, that may just be for the admissions into school, not your ability on whether you're going to help that team become a better team and win championships. I will just add one thing to that is, um, like Colin mentioned, um, things like extra qualifications that um, you might have uh, will count towards your um, extracurricular activities on your applications, uh, which the universities um, basically look at and take into consideration. So the better I guess the more impact your extracurricular activities have, the more chances you have of getting admitted to that school. But it doesn't mean that you will um, get a sports scholarship. The, the, the term we use, and we, 
do it all the time is student athlete with a hyphen in between. The student, and, and this works out really well for this kind of uh, understanding, you are a student at the university, and then separately, you're an athlete for whatever that sport is. And so for the admissions part, when we talk about applying and admissions, you're only talking about the you being a student in the university, while um, going and trying to get recruited and being observed and trying to get athletic scholarship, that is all to do with being the athlete on the team of whatever the, the the sport might be. And that is all entirely, that has nothing to do with uh, your, your extracurricular. That's all going to do to whether the coach deems you good enough to be on that team. That's great. Um, thank you very much, Colin. Thank you for explaining this process um, to us and all the students. Um, if you guys have any questions, uh, you could always email us at advising at fulbright.org.uk uh, and we will be able to answer any questions that you might have about sports scholarships or just applications to US universities. Um, thank you, Colin. Hope everyone has a very good evening. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Great Thanks. questions today. <laughs> Bye, everyone. <laughs>